very pleased to say I'm joined by Tom, Tom Tuggenhat, Conservative MP for Tunbridge and a Shadow Minister for Security, also served in government and, more importantly, if the bookies are correct, in the top three as a contender for uh, the next leader of the Conservative Party. Tom, welcome to the show. I know you're in Hustings in the North. We'll touch on that in a little bit. But let me uh, open, if I may. Shouldn't the next Conservative leader whoever that person may be, start by apologising for gifting the country a Labour government with this huge majority that is now singling out pensioners to fund, it seems, endless union pay demands. Yes, Nick, it should. And the person who leads the Conservative Party, and I hope it'll be me, will apologise. And the reason I say that is because, look, I'm here in Yarm School uh, near Stockton, and... Frankly, this is a fantastic school that's educated many, many kids from parents who've scrimped and saved and struggled to pay the bills. Uh, and now Labour's trying to put tax on them, more tax. Uh, old people around this community are really going to feel the loss, not just of the winter fuel payment, but actually the loss of support in so many other areas. They've pulled the railway fund. They've reopened deals that were supposed to be closed and done on hospitals, uh, on businesses and support. They're, you know, they're just time and time again, they've ripped up the rule book and they're acting as though they've got, you know, this huge mandate. They don't. They've got a massive majority, but they've got a very small mandate. Because let's be honest, Nick, you saw the election, you followed the polls all night and you looked at the votes and actually Keir Starmer barely moved. He got fewer votes than uh, Jeremy Corbyn. He, his polling really didn't move very much. The truth is people were angry at us, and I, I understand why. We let people down, we had too much infighting, too much factionalism, and we forgot that the Conservative Party, that actually that every MP fundamentally works for the British people. And too many of my colleagues forgot that. Well, they we'll, um, Tom, if we... Sort of party, but Tom, not the country. Tom, if we may, we'll come back to unity, which you are putting a lot of emphasis on. Uh, but yeah. you're, up in, you're up in the one part of the country, I've probably got this wrong, but the one part of the country where the local leader is actually a Conservative. There's not many of those in the regional mayor, Ben Houchen. Why are you up there, apart from the hustings? Can you learn anything from uh, Ben's success that you can translate onto the stage of national politics? Absolutely. There's a huge amount to learn from Ben. And what Ben's demonstrated is that there's the best side of conservatism, that the state has a role, the government has a role, but it's not the same as society. And what Ben's done is he's managed to tie those bits together so that the state has helped in redeveloping Teesside. Now, look, seven years ago, eight years ago, in 2017, when he came in, the red car steelworks were an eyesore and a crumbling cost on many, many people, including the UK taxpayer, but also on the people of Teesside. What he did is he brought in public money without raising any taxes and made sure that he prepared the ground and turned the Europeans, Europe's biggest brownfield site with £6 billion. He's turned it into the U UK's biggest building project. And now there's already thousands of jobs there. There's 24-hour construction. There's the biggest South uh, Korean investment in the UK ever. There's a new key and there's so much more going on. And you're about to see an entire new industry coming out there, net zero turbines, which is a new way of producing energy from natural gas, but also capturing that carbon emission uh, to make it greener. Now, that's not just going to transform power in the northeast. That's going to transform power around the world because the skills of those engineers and innovators in the northeast are going to be needed and wanted and demanded around the world. Okay. That'll put money in people's pockets and transform the entire UK. Okay, so good lesson to learn from there. But much of your publicity that I'm obviously seeing and watching, you talk about unity and beating Labour as, as if you like, your mantra. Now, you come right. from one of the most uh, divided Conservative parties I ever remember, and Tom, I'm a lot older than you. Um, but my Not question to you is, call. my question to you is, what would you unite around? Isn't that the difficulty for the Conservative Parliamentary Party, let alone the wider party? So, Nick, actually, I don't agree. I mean, the reality is when you look at what has divided Conservatives in the last five years, actually, it's been what some people have called the narcissism of small differences. We've forgotten what unites us because we've focused on what divides. If you look at what unites us, it's the objection to these tax-raising Labour governments that have consistently put the British people second and their own political interests first. They want to stuff the pockets of their union bosses, not help people who are already struggling in the UK. And we need to make sure we remember that. Because as Conservatives, we unite around three 
fundamental things. We unite around security, and it's been my privilege to keep our country safe as a minister and before that as a soldier for the best part of 25 years, and it's been a huge privilege to do it. The second thing was we unite around low taxes, not because we're ideological, but because it, we... Even were. though you put them up, Tom? Well, and as you know, that's why I didn't support the national insurance contributions rise. As you know, that was one of my... One of my rebellions, I'm afraid, and I wish I hadn't had to do it. But I think that as Conservatives, we have a vision and an optimism towards low taxes. And I have a plan to get there because the reality is what we need to see is more power in people's own persons and not being taken over by the state. Let's not forget this. This isn't an ideological point. You and I know that this country is more efficient, delivers better growth, delivers real opportunity if people have control over their own lives. When the state puts its hand in your pocket and tells you what to do and what to spend, you get waste, you get waste, you get waste. I'm sure a lot of people will be cheering that remark on. But Tom, in perception terms, you're seen as a centrist. Some people are arguing that other contenders, like Priti Patel, they're more to the right of the party, hence my talk about unity. Can you um, bear with me? Because we took a, a long call, which I've edited, about someone who wants to challenge, if you like, where you stand in the party. And perhaps you could respond to this message from Anna in Surrey, uh, which is about 20 seconds. Tom Tugendhat, you're rattling on about the middle ground. The middle ground is what lost you the last election. You are still not listening to your base voter. We do not want the middle ground. Reform are going to wipe you out at the next election. So, Tom, are you going to move from the left middle ground, I would say, and come back to Tor what Tories want, or are you going to be obliterated? You get the gist. I do. And look, I've never spoken about the middle ground. I've never mentioned the word centrist and I never talk about left or right because it doesn't mean anything. I'm the only one who voted against the vaccine passports and I voted against it because I thought that that was wrong. Does that put me on the right of the party? I'm the one who stood up for individual liberty. I'm the one who didn't support tax rises in our, uh, in the, for the national insurance contribution rise. Does that put me on the right of the party? No, I think it puts me firmly in the conservative bracket. I am a conservative. I'm a conservative who fundamentally believes in people's liberty, in stronger borders, in lower taxes, and in the ability for people to determine their own future. That's what I stand for. That's why I'm passionate about bringing down migration, because the levels we've got are wrong. We, I am passionate about ending small boats and ending illegal trafficking because keeping our country safe and keeping our borders secure is essential. And that's why, as security minister, I was the one who introduced the National Security Act that saw more Russian and Chinese agents charged and arrested than in the decade before I was and, in charge. And you're actually on a... On the left or the right? You're no, actually on a... Me a conservative. You're actually on a list, aren't you, that the Chinese uh, basically won't tolerate you, which um, no. I think is presumably a badge of honour. Can I move on to a topic? More you than spoke... that, actually, Nick. I'm, I'm, I'm on a list by the, the Russians hate me, the Chinese hate me, and the Iranians target me. So, you know, you take your pick. Right, OK. Just want to move on. You made a, an interesting speech earlier in the week, and I, I just want to address part of it. You were talking about the riots, particularly the post riots riot uh, in environment. Um, now, now, look, you talked about a collapse of social trust. What is quite interesting is that there is this growing perception, and I think James Cleverly, one of your colleagues and opponents in this, has talked about the fact that there is a perception of two-tier policing. I think two-tier justice system, actually, when you look at sentencing for rioters and what is uh, not going on for people waving machetes around and, and attacking cars. The, 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 the equivalence, if you like, is not happening in sentencing. Um, isn't it time we started talking about unfashionable um, uh, issues like what was behind the riots, apart from the more obvious, the, the cause of resentment, the fact that some people feel they cannot talk about immigration? Where do you stand in how we now move on post-riots? So, look, I gave uh, the speech that, frankly, should have been given from number 10, because what we need in moments like this is we need national leadership. And we don't need the sort of inaction that we've seen from Keir Starmer. We need Cobra to be called, and he only attended it after I demanded that he did. 
Uh, and we need the kind of analysis and understanding that really makes a difference. Now, this isn't just two-tier policing. It's inconsistent policing. You know, the truth is different communities have been policed in different ways in different places. So it's not even as though you can predict based on what happened last time. You, you can't. And a lot of that's down to so-called community leaders. Now, the only communities in this country that count are those who are democratically elected. And the police need to focus on policing this country fairly, without fear or favour, not on engaging with self-appointed so-called community leaders. Now, that's what I was calling out. And I think we need to be absolutely clear about it, that what these riots showed was, first of all, they showed that there is a pattern of criminality that I'm afraid has not been dealt with. And I, you know, I've got to put my hand up. We've been in power for 14 years. Some of that's on us. And the reality is that different Home Secretaries, different, shadow, different ch Lord Chancellors haven't been able to make the difference in policing that we've needed to see. We haven't seen enough prison places. And that means, as my friend Neil O'Brien, the MP, uh, as you know, ha has reported uh, and demonstrated, there are quite literally hundreds of people who have been committed offence after offence after offence and have still not gone to prison. Would you build more we prisons? Absolutely, we need to build more prisons. And by the way, we need to rationalise the prison estate. Why do we have prisons like Pentonville in the centre of town on multi-billion pound pieces of land when we could use that money, spend, that, spend the money there, uh, sorry, sell the property there and spend the money on more prisons around the country. We need to update our prison network. We need to do better at probation. We need to help prisoners to get back into work. All that is true, but the basis starts, we need to protect the British people. If we, are, we, if we are prepared, and this government has now said, oh, the deterrent effect helped reduce further riots. If deterrents work, should you be pressing in Parliament and commit under a Tom uh, Tug and Hat leadership that actually we need to toughen up our sentencing? Well, the first thing we need to do is build more prisons because actually the sentencing is roughly fine. The problem is that we're not applying the sentences. People get five, 10, 15 years for a crime and spend about three, four, five, 10 years in prison. That's not okay. And the reason they're being let out early is because we don't have enough prison places. So the first thing is actually not toughening up sentences, but making sure people serve the sentences they've been but, given. But we don't get people being set a sentence for some of the things we've been sentenced in a riot environment where they're getting one, two, three years. A woman throwing a wheelie bin at the police in riot circumstances, absolutely crazy, deserves punishing. She's getting two years. We don't do that outside of riots, do we? Uh, it Doesn't that just help build this sense of injustice that there's one rule for them? Them and one rule for others. But Nick, that's exactly why we need to be uh, consistent in policing. And that's exactly why in the speech I gave on Tuesday, I spoke about the inconsistencies that we've seen in policing. Because we need to take the politics out of policing and let policing get back to what it should be. Justice and fairness for the British people, keeping us safe and keeping criminals locked up. Now, I've got to go. One, one question for you. Um, a poll you published on your X feed shows you one point ahead of James Cleverley and the two of you streets ahead of the opposition in Conservative voters' minds from 2024. Shouldn't you and James Cleverley be considering doing a Blair Brown partnership and then walk home with the leadership? Look, I am not a believer in stitching this up. I believe that the members have the right to vote and have the right to, to express their views, and I'm not doing any deals, any backroom deals. I'm trusting our members. But let me just say very clearly, all five of these people are friends of mine. James is a really, really good mate, and he's a wonderful guy, and I'm enjoying going around the country, sometimes with him, as I am today, uh, and usually just meeting up with members around the place. And, you know, so's Kemi, so's Rob, so's Pretty, and so's Mel. These are good Conservative friends of mine, and I'm really looking forward to having the debates that we're having and to making sure that Conservative voices are heard across the United Kingdom. Tom, thank you very much for joining us.